So the, um, this metaphor is used for a lot of different things. And it's, um, today we're gonna use it in, in relationship to identity. And so an iceberg, roughly 10 to 12% of the actual iceberg is above the surface. Um, so the vast majority of it is, is hidden. So what I'm going to ask you to do is label uh, characteristics or qualities, things about who you are, um, things that everyone would know at first glance about you, um, goes above the surface of the water. Things that, that some people might know um, at first glance would be near the surface, and then things that are um, as you move down the iceberg, it's stuff that only you know at the very bottom. So you go from everyone knows to things that acquaintances know to things that family and friends know to things that only you know. So these words? Okay. Words. And then you can, so for example, like I'm sort of built like a fire hydrant, so that's at the very top. Um, male, light skin, so stuff that's, that's evidence um, goes above the surface. And then you just draw or encircle those words. And then as you get further down the iceberg, the things that, that only you know or things that your fam family, friends, close acquaintances know. And that's, it's something that you guys can get started on and then kind of add to throughout. Um, the goal would be eventually to have it more or less filled out and then we'll come back to the, to the metaphor um, as, we, as we move forward. Hello. labeling the iceberg with qualities or things about who you are. The things that everyone knows who doesn't know you. Everyone who sees you knows this. And then the further down you go, this is the stuff that only you know. So like friends, family, acquaintances, everyone. So um, just a little bit about my background as you guys are working on this. Um, I actually graduated from UNC in, in 1994 uh, through the history department. And I have been teaching and coaching um, ever since at the place actually where I student taught, um, Ponderosa High School, which is in Douglas County. So the, um, as I grew as, a, as an educator and had opportunities to teach a variety of different things. Um, Holocaust history, um, having had that course in undergrad, um, was always something that I tried to um, insert, whether it was US history or European history or world history, whatever it was. And it is, it's a passion of mine. And so as opportunities arise um, in, academia and I was completing my graduate degree. Um, I wanted to try and marry two passions in that project because it was, it was so intense and it took so long and I was away from my family um, writing for such a large chunk of time. It had to be something that was meaningful and I didn't want to do uh, um, a t-test score about pre and post test implementation in some sort of educational setting. I wanted it to be something that, that brought passion out of me. And so I chose a qualitative study. And um, my dissertation was about um, teaching about the Holocaust and genocide through art. And it was two 
advanced placement studio art students in high school. So I worked with um, art teachers to develop curriculum and we spent a month, two weeks essentially going through the curriculum and then I spent weeks beyond that trying to um, observe and understand and interview students as they created their own original responses to that work. And so um, one of the things out of that study among many, but one of the things that, that continues to push or drive me was the authenticity that students felt and captured in their work. And I loved art, as, especially as a young kid. And um, through the <coughs> educated education process, that sort of love was sort of stamped out of me. Like the, you'll never make a living if you do this, the typical, you need to be driven to do something else. And so I kind of let it slide. Um, and rediscovering that passion and um, re-engaging in that type of, of thinking has transformed everything that I do. And so one of the things that came out of that study was the um, intense level of empathy that was connected to the study. They, the students, because they were able to create and sort of come to these um, really difficult topics on their own terms, they were able to meet it on, at a pace that was appropriate for them. And it wasn't me mandating or dictating that you have to feel this way, you have to, do, you have to um, approach it in the way that you think or the way that you write in any way. I sort of just watched what happened and it was, um, it was incredibly profound. So the, since that point, um, I've done whatever I could to try and insert as much art as possible. And not just visual art, but um, music, poetry, narrative, anything non-discursive in a way to try and capture the imagination of, of young people. Because I, I don't think you can be empathetic without being imaginative. And um, the gateway to empathy is imagination. The gateway to imagination, I think, is art. So what we're going to do today as it relates to empathy and identity is we're going to try and um, dig deeper into three different people. Um, all three of them are artists. Um, two who didn't survive the Holocaust and one who did. Um, but all who sort of, who, whose art um, along with their journey allows us to connect to them in a, in a much deeper way than I think is possible in, a, in other venues. Colorado Holocaust Educators, the organization that I'm a part of, um, was formed in 2012. Um, all of us are uh, U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum teacher fellows. And there were six of us in Colorado. I think there's now nine. But there were six originally. And um, we met a few different times. And Colorado didn't, didn't really, um, there were a variety of different institutions that were offering educational experiences. Um, and we felt like we, we had uh, a niche where we could help sort of bridge gaps between a variety of different organizations. And we try and, and uh, facilitate partnerships with different groups. And so the majority of the work that we do is teacher training. Um, but we host community events and we do a variety of different things as well. And so that is, that is me. So the three people that we're gonna we're gonna look at are Gideon Klein, Gila Schelkstein, and uh, Marion Kulichev, who is um, one's a musician, um, Gila is a uh, painter, and Marion is a he was a set designer originally, and um, 
So what we're going to try and do is understand how um, their identities played a significant role in what happens to them. Um, and the portions of their identities that ended up making the big difference in, in terms of how they're perceived by others. Um, as you'll notice, and I don't know how much you filled out in your, in your iceberg, but the, the stuff that matters most to us as individuals is typically below the surface. It's, it is the stuff that makes us who we are um, that requires our story, right? You don't know, um, you don't know someone based on their appearance, and yet we rely on that a lot. And um, in some ways, that's that's one of the lessons that we need to draw from this period is that that type of behavior is something that we have to we have to push past. We have to be able to see people for for who they are on their own terms. And so we're going to try and and get to know these three folks. So the first person we're going to look at is Gideon Klein. And um, Gideon Klein is, um, he lives in Morovia originally, and he, um, at the age of 10, begins commuting to Prague once a month to take piano lessons. He had shown a tremendous affinity for for music, his older sister, who already lived in Prague, was was 16, and um, he he wasn't very helpful on the farm. Among his siblings, he was the least likely to um, to stop playing piano to do chores, or and so it was almost like a once a month break, not just for him to get the opportunity to go play and learn, but his parents who found him at times incorrigible and unhelpful. I think it, it, you know, not yelling at your child to do something once a month is probably not a bad thing. But it's, he traveled 150 miles essentially as a 10 year old once a month to the city. And so, the, the city of Prague in terms of the arts was dominated by the cafe scene. And there's two main cafes in Prague, Cafe Lucerna and Cafe Mainz, and they'll, there'll be a picture of each. And um, because of what was happening in the 1930s in other former art capitals like Berlin, Madrid, Rome, Prague became the, the one sort of safe place where <laughs> And at these cafes, Lucerna and Mainz, you have a collection of, of folks like Matisse and Picasso, Rachmaninoff, and artists from all over the place meeting in Prague um, in this sort of bustling cafe scene where incredibly dynamic and critical conversations are happening about life, about the state of Europe, about what's happening, about responding to fascism. And so, um, Gideon Klein's sister is, is engaged in this scene, so as he visits her once a month from the age of 10 on, he's visiting these places. So he grows up in this culture of really high expectations, not just for his own practice, but for the way he approaches his thinking, and the way he approaches um, his craft. What's his sister's name? Um, I'm sorry. I, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no. Maybe there's a deep connection between what she developed artistically. There, she's also um, 
uh, pianist. And um, it was her connection to the instructors that allowed him into that realm or whatever. Um, she ends up getting out of Prague. Um, and I, I'm blanking on her name, but I can, I'll absolutely find she out for you. Yes. And so she ends up going to um, the London School of Music, and Gideon turns down that um, appointment um, because he wants to st he wants to stay in Prague. He's still performing, um, and he ends up arrested uh, soon after turning that appointment down. But I'll I'll definitely grab her name because I have it in my notes. I just I can't think of it off the top of my head. So um, this, actually I took the picture of that piano because Rachmaninoff played on that piano. <laughs> so, which was mesmerizing to me. I'm not a musician, um, but I know he's incredible and in, being in that same room and in that same atmosphere was just pretty remarkable. So this is the inside of that cafe. And this is the other cafe, which is right along the St. Charles River, um, Cafe Mainz. So he grows up um, tuned into this really high level conversation that is occurring in Prague during a really tumultuous time in Europe. And um, pours into his music. Um, he's, a, he's a brilliant musician and a good student, but music is his, by far his overwhelming priority. And so um, he spends the vast majority of, of his free time um, practicing, learning. It's, it is his true passion. So the, um, this is, now it's a series of apartments. It was the, the day school that they went to when they were children. Um, at 13, his parents send him to Prague full time to live with his sister. And so he um, enters high school um, with the same sort of um, high school problems that everybody has. The, he's, he writes about his crushes, he writes about um, this class being boring, like he didn't really like math. Um, the the uh, the overwhelming. So he kept the journals. Yeah, yeah, um, and some of them, he's there's um, there's actually a ton of things that are that continue to just pop up. And so um, Terzin, where he ends up, is, and the people who he communicated with in Prague, um, many of them held on to his works. Like he begins writing music, I'll talk about that here in a little bit. And, and it was hidden, um, not just during the war, but it was hidden after the war because the Soviets came. And so, um, it wasn't until the mid 90s that any of this stuff begins to, to come out. And so there's a ton of researchers who are trying to compile um, the body of his works, but they're scattered everywhere. Like some of it was with his sister in the UK, um, some of it was with friends in Prague, some of it was hidden in Terzin. So some of it, it's, it's been an ongoing um, task to try and pull all of that stuff together. Um, this was the conservatory, this building here, um, that he studied in following high school. Um, he finishes in a little over two years and then re-enters. And um, by the age of 14, he's performing piano publicly in Prague, which is the, like the, it's a significant opportunity to perform there. Um, and is getting really, really high reviews in the newspapers and in publications about his ability as a pianist um, at 16, 17, 
years old. He's, he's a phenom. Um, he begins to, to, once he finishes with his um, performance degree, he goes into composing. And, and uh, they use, it's sort of from Czech, the loose translation, I was told, is utmost. So they have, there are five musicians in Czech history who have been given that sort of title. And they begin to, to describe Gideon Klein in those terms. Not formally, but there, there is tremendous hope that as an adult, um, he'll be lifting Czech music to, to different heights. So, he, um, when the war begins and, and um, Germany invades not just the Sudetenland but then the Czech Republic, they, uh, they make it illegal for um, Jews to perform in public. They, along, among a variety of other things. But in terms of Gideon Klein's work and his life, um, his opportunities begin to dwindle. And it's, it's the struggle against that um, immediate oppression that um, he performs under pseudonyms. But he's so good that they're, like, it's impossible for him to hide. And um, he's arrested in in 41 and transferred here. This is the town Terezin, um, which is about 45 minutes um, outside of Prague. So it was built as like a fortress town in the fort late 1200s, 1300s, um, as a, to house a garrison. And so the town is built for at most six, seven thousand people, um, but this is the during World War II. As the Germans are getting more international pressure, especially from the Red Cross, for conditions in the camps, they sort of um, they prop this ghetto up as like a the city for the Jews, or this is this is where. Um, they shoot a number of different propaganda films about how well they're being treated, and so they this go is ahead. The camp, then. This is the, the, the town, yeah. This is the town. So where's the camp? As it's as this is the ghetto. The small fortress is within, the small the fortress is yeah. The ghetto is within this fence. It's beautiful. Hey. So I've never seen that before. Yeah, yeah. Terezin in Czech, yeah. Terezin yeah. in German. In German, it's yeah. German yeah. term. For it. Right. Jeez. So it, um, there's still, still residents there, and it's uh, mostly social housing or whatever. So it's. Um, it, I don't know, I had, I had a lot of difficulty reconciling, like, living there today and op operating businesses and, yeah, yeah. Um, but they, they have a, the thing that, um, that makes getting clients life here um, remarkable is that in conditions where you're living in a 30 inch by 30 inch space um, and subject to hard labor and horrific conditions, um, the courage of people like Gideon Klein and Raphael Schachter and, and others to use their free time to sort of recapture their, um, their life and their identity through music and through painting and through sketching is remarkable. And so he, um, he continues to write tremendous amount of music while he's in prison here. Um, much of it we've been able to recover, um, but it's a... Uh, is that the Moldau River or what river is by? 
Um, you knew we were going to ask that. I know. <laughs> I, I'm not sure which one. Like Come on, Derek. Major, um, thoroughfare of commerce. Uh -huh. so, um, I was wondering, too. I don't, um, the reason I don't think that it is is the, they built this garrison city to sort of protect from um, invasions and no, they hardly ever used it because the invaders just went around it. And so, um, so I don't think that the, I'm not sure that that river is significant other than the area of farms that are around it. But again, that's something I can find out for sure. So this is a picture that was taken um, in the ghetto, in the town. The, at its um, at its height, estimates of the population was around 70,000. And so you have a town built for 6,000 people and you house 70,000 people in it. Um, and so the living conditions are, are horrific. Um, they're, um, but they also, because they had planned to shoot these films, these propaganda films, they also try and transfer um, prisoners, prisoners who were renowned or people who, who were easily identified as being skilled in some way or another um, were transferred here. And so there is a tremendous collection or concentration of highly skilled professors and artists and composers all in this one place. And so the work that comes out of um, of Terezin is remarkable, um, especially given the conditions that they're um, that they're living in. But it becomes a, a sanctuary. The being able to play and Rafi Schechter, who um, is also from Prague and a close friend. Yes. Is this about 1942. Or what time are we looking at? Here? This is 40. This is 42. This photo. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Pretty good guess. So they, in the basement of one of these um, barracks, they found an old piano. And so they s snuck down there at night and started playing, and then more people joined them. And um, the Gideon Klein helps them um, prepare for what eventually will be a, um, a performance, because when the Red Cross eventually comes to, to Terzine and they film this, there's a performance of a choir and they sing um, Verdi's Requiem, Requiem, right. And so it, which is about like you, I mean, they sang it, they learned it from rote in Latin um, and did it all at night, oftentimes completely in secret. Um, it became, uh, an amazing um, example of defiance in, in the face of what they're dealing with. He's talking about, um, Michael Flack here is talking about uh, Gideon Klein's piano. So this is a, um, 
uh, painting that is done actually by um, a 14 year old boy. Um, named Peter Kine. So that's the last image. Uh, yeah, of Gideon Klein. Did he die then? Or? When does he... he He's, he is. So shortly after the um, performance of the Requiem um, the, and the, re the visit from the Red Cross, the ghettos, um, the prisoners from the ghetto are transferred to Auschwitz. So he, um, he ends up at Auschwitz and um, is, 12 days um, before liberation, he's on a march and is um, shot by a guard. So um, the, what I wanted to have you see and listen to is Um, there's a series of different pieces composed by Klein, and um, we'll just listen to the first chunk of this. It's about four minutes, but it's a complete piece. Okay. So I'm going to, sorry, I paused it. This, um, the date on this composition is um, about three weeks before he's deported. So it's one of the last things that he composed. Okay, so the, um, try and imagine that setting, right? What that, the, the type of life that he's, um, living without an ability to, um, to, to change the dynamic that he's in, without the ability to, to be with his sister, with his family, all those things. And... Um, What's the title of this again? String Trio? String Trio. It's just Gideon Klein String Trio. Three movement thing, allegro, adagio, that kind of thing, or just, well, trio just means three instruments. Right. Well, I don't know, but they're usually kind of three movements, like allegro, adagio, and so on. Not always, especially in romantic music. There's often four, four movements.
Thank you.
Um, so I'm going to shift to a woman from uh, Warsaw named Gila Schechstein, who um, is a really young painter artist in a um, in a pretty thriving artistic Jewish community in that in that city, and um, she is. Um, still in training and beginning to, um, to break through in that realm um, when the war begins and she ends up in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, the Onyx Shabbat is the, um, is in reference to Emanuel Ringelblum who buried um, a variety of different um, cultural documents, um, pieces of art, and so the there were ten um, metal boxes and three um, milk canisters, and they packed them with um, with journals, with writing, with um, with pieces of art, and. It's only because of this archive that we have any information about about Gita. So, and they were buried then. Yes. So, in during the Warsaw Ghetto, they um, it was a few months prior to the uprising um, that they picked places around within the Warsaw Ghetto to bury these, um, and they're really thick metal canisters and boxes in various places. The third um, milk can they never found. There was um, pretty significant um, conjecture maybe that it was in that it was buried in underneath the Chinese consulate and the Chinese consulate wouldn't give them permission to um, to dig but eventually they did and they didn't find anything. Um, it is likely that it that it's rusted through or that it hasn't made it to this point. Um, but the other two milk cans and, um, and the boxes were recovered. There's so, yes, yeah. Gosh, it might be somewhere. So, maybe, I mean, when I, uh, the, it's the Emanuel Ringelblum archive. So one of these, this is the one that's at the Holocaust Memorial Museum in DC. on display somewhere? Yeah, it's in it's in the exhibit in DC. Oh, in, that, in, there. in the Holocaust Memorial Museum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's um, there's a museum in Warsaw that houses um, that houses the archive and they put um, they gallery her work every once in a while. Um, but they've cataloged every every piece and the whole thing is now digitized and and so you can read through um, much of it's been translated to English but not all of it um, but a lot of the work is now how did they find this and how did they know it existed they um, the um, Emmanuel Ringelblum ran, the Onyx Shabbat was like a, um, a group that had connections not just within the ghetto but outside the ghetto. And so people outside, um, there were some Polish resistance groups that had information um, about it. Um, the, the maps or whatever that, that showed where they were, um, were non-existent, so it was through like excavation. This the photo 
just prior to this is from 1950. So they had only found three boxes and two of the milk cans by 1950 and continued to, to look. The thing about Warsaw is that the entire city was leveled. And so through the rebuilding process, they uncovered a lot of this. And so over the span of um, several years, they, they found more and more of it. So, but it's in the archive itself that they discovered that there was the ex that there were ten steel boxes and that there were three milk cans and and so, once they found some of it, then they began to look, on purpose for for all of it. They just haven't found all of it, didn't you? I apologize. Sure. I got stuck with Gideon Klein waiting for somebody to play that piano. Uh, what's the person's name that we're looking at now from uh, Warsaw? It's Gita. Schleckstein. Yes, Schleckstein. Mm. Sorry about that. No, no, no. You're mesmerizing your audience. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so this is her. Um, she um, she gets married fairly young, um, and the um, and it's actually right before the war in thirty eight in nineteen forty um, she gives birth to her daughter. So um, they are so her passion and study of art re remains a, um, a focal point for her, but her focus shifts to her daughter. And she actually, much of her work um, done while in the Warsaw Ghetto is, um, is around children. She does a lot of portraits of, of children. She liked to draw and she loved watercolor, um, but access to that material is incredibly difficult. And, um, and essentially, given the circumstances in the ghetto, illegal. They didn't, the Germans didn't want anybody chronicling any of the life conditions. So they, all that stuff was, um, was hidden or, or held at great risk. And so, even whether it was writing poetry, people weren't supposed to have paper, they weren't supposed to have pencils, they, they sure weren't supposed to have um, watercolors. So it's, it's that, um, the passion for that type of work and the ability to, to perform like that under those conditions that I think is so, um, is so powerful about art in general and that people would risk everything to capture the image of this girl who and you have to realize too that with Gideon Klein with Gita Sechstein the reason that we know of them is because they had certain privileges that that thousands of others didn't and so we know their names because they managed to to um, get their work included in this through this system, but in Warsaw or by smuggling out and having connections, smuggling out work in Terezin, but there are, there are thousands of others who didn't. And so <coughs> this girl who, and we don't know who <coughs> this is, but the identities of these people Um, she, um, <coughs> right in, um, in April of 42, there's, they 
there's like a mad dash to try and um, index all the stuff that's in there. Um, and some of the work is uh, titled and some of it and some of it isn't. These two pieces are not. Um, Yeah. So these were all for the Rainbow Blue? Yeah. yeah. All of her work was in there. This is her husband. Yeah, that's her quote. And you said she was also founded in Terzi? No, she, um, she was in Warsaw, yeah. Um, and there, for a long time, they thought that it was likely that she and her daughter died in Mila, 18, during the mm -hmm. uprising. Um, and, but they're not sure that that's the case. Um, so, so if it wasn't there, then it was in... Um, but there's no record of her in the concentration camps? No. No. Okay. So it was either during the uprising or in Treblinka. Or where? Treblinka. Oh. Was Treblinka a concentration camp, labor camp, or was it also a, like a crematorium and a killing center? Yeah, it's, it, it was part of the um, the Killing centers that came about in '42, and it, its sole purpose was was killing. There was there was a farm, and they ha actually they had a a zoo sort of to entertain the guards, but there was no labor really done at all. Well, you know, I'm 65, you're 66 in June. It's difficult to keep track of all that stuff from 70 years ago, mainly because right. Auschwitz, Birkenau, Bergen-Belsen. Uh, Dachau, uh, Treblinka, Sobibor, so on and so forth. It, there get to be so many names right. that they kind of get jumbled together, you know what I mean? Oh, I do, I do. Yeah. And there's, um, they, the museum and another, or several other institutions have sort of broadened the definition of concentration camp because um, it, it was for a long time, you know, you had to know these six or they, right. And now there's thousands, like literally thousands of them throughout Eastern Europe and Germany. And, and so the, uh, the broadening of that um, classification has led to different conversations about um, collaborators. And, and so it's, it's made it far more complex a topic for sure. So this is the only self-portrait she ever that she ever did, and it's one of the last things that's in the archive. But there's like she her work dominates the archive. There aren't other artists um, that have like they have. 300 different pieces or so of hers and there aren't there are just scraps of other people's art so I think it was a um, the theory is that there was just kind of a mad dash to collect whatever they could and they she was the only one that had work her husband knew Emanuel Ringelblum so there was that connection as well um, but most of the other artists had already passed by then So the archive is predominantly a visual? There, it's, um, there's, 
there's both. There's a lot of um, poetry and and narrative, and there's a lot of journal um, information. There's um, a lot of cultural documents and 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 uh, the uh, identification papers, and there's a it's a mix of a ton of different things. Um, but it it's it there task was to preserve elements of Jewish life that, that, right, yeah, yeah, more or less, and because the goal was to, to end that, so, I mean, as though it never existed, and so fighting against that became a, um, a really intense battle. So, this, this artist is, unlike the other two, he, um, he survives the Holocaust, but his story and his ability to express his memory through art, I think, is um, is fascinating. So he's um, Marian Kowaljev is a when the war starts, he's 18, and his intent is to join the partisan groups um, that are along the border of Poland and the Ukraine and he's arrested at the border and he is he ends up on the very first transport to Auschwitz so um, he um, is in that camp for several years uh, he's transported to two other camps before he's finally liberated um, and then he after the war ends, he goes to um, Jagiellonian University, which is in Krakow, Poland, and he um, gets a degree in fine art and becomes a really prominent uh, set designer in theater. And then eventually, when film begins, he starts to do a lot of work in film and becomes a really um, quite famous artist in his own right, but never, um, never talks about his experiences, never talks about what happened during World War II, never talks about Auschwitz um, until the 1990s he has a stroke. And when, um, when he emerges from that experience still with an inability to use half of his body more or less, um, he rehabs and becomes almost obsessed with creating art to capture his memory from, from Auschwitz. And so from the time he awakes from that, that episode until um, his death, he draws more or less nonstop. And so um, the, the work begins to capture um, people's imagination and they try and do um, some traveling exhibi you know, exhibitions of his work and he never never feels comfortable doing that and he's because he always feels like it's an incomplete story and he always feels like there's more more to it and so in 2003 um, the on the grounds at Auschwitz, actually, where in the fields where he was forced to labor, there's now a Franciscan monastery, and so he approached um, the um, monastery with this concept for a permanent installation of his work, and they agreed. So they turned the basement of this monastery into what's called the labyrinth and it's the entire exhibit is his artwork and his design and so essentially you're you go down the stairs um, in this monastery and you enter um, it's I, I can only describe it as like his nightmare it's you can't escape the your immersion and you're surrounded completely in art, and I'll show you some of the images that um, that I captured when I was when I was in there. But it's 
it is one of the most powerful um, installations or 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 elements of memory that I've that I've ever encountered. Are some of these people? The What's that? What's the name of the monastery? Um, monastery. Yeah, I, I'll get that to you Are as well. Are some of these people real people? Because some of those look really fun. Really familiar. <laughs> really, they're, um, it's all like people he Photographic he knew, and um, so the the ceiling in the installation is about twelve feet tall. So this is from the monastery. This, yeah, this image is in the monastery. And what are the things on the bottom? They're um, the they're right, and they're so they're. It's uh, pieces of plywood that are painted black with just numbers. That is cool. I see Einstein. Yeah. 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 Oh my. Oh my. Jeez. Is that a mirror above, or is that a panel? It's a panel. So there's on top of this whole thing is like shattered plexiglass. And he remarks um, in an interview with, they, they created a film called The Labyrinth, which is about 40 minutes or so, to try and document um, his thinking as he was creating this. Um, but the, uh, he makes the remark in that, um, in that interview that he's not sure he ever would have returned to Auschwitz had it not been for his stroke. And um, so the, like, the amount of work that's contained in this one place is just is incredible. Is it a, a kind of a rotating exhibit, or are, are these all just there? They're all just there, yeah. And so it's called the labyrinth um, because it literally, like you, you can probably find your way out if you're not guided, but it's, it's not easy. And on this trip, um, I was with, uh, four faculty fellows and uh, 11 grad students and we had been, this was toward the end of, of four weeks in Poland and um, it was the first time that there were four or five people that were like, I, this is too much. Like I, and so they had to leave early and so the, the monk had to escort them out and then try and find everyone else. So people were scattered It was, and it was kind of a terrifying situation. Um, How many years did you work on this before? The end of the day? Uh, about 11. Wow. And it was compulsive. Like there were days where he wouldn't sleep. Like he would just draw without sleep. <laughs> and it's all um, ink. Media it's ink on, on parchment or on So for the first couple of years as he's rehabbing, he's laying on the floor doing it until he has enough strength and dexterity to sit upright, but there, it's all um, pen and ink. Do you have a translation of that bottom part? I don't. Um, Is that just the title of that or a sentence that says something? Looks like it's it looks Polish. Like Polish. It is Polish. <laughs> Polska. Polska. Mm -hmm. Is it the Saint Maximilian Kolbe? Saint yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so yeah um, Maximilian Kolbe is featured prominently in his work as well. His story becomes kind of a legend. Um, among prisoners. Right. He's a, he's a, a saint yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he. Um, 
it's the it's part of a center. Then, you have the St. Maximilian Colby Center, and it's actually, I think, also a museum. That right. houses the, the labyrinth. Yeah. And, and in medieval tradition, too, the labyrinth is the time oh, for yeah. reflection, you know, to mm -hmm. kind of walk the labyrinth. Mm -hmm. But it's also the Theseus and the Minotaur in Greek mythology. Right. Where right. There's this monster pursuing him. Right. Right. Symbolic of death. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's kind of playing up both of them. Oh, yeah. Being trapped in this entanglement and trying to find your way out. I think yeah. there's a lot of minotaurs in there. And you can see some tails mm -hmm. and some creatures. Creepy. Is that his number? That is his number. Yes, sir. I had a question. You said he went to Auschwitz very early. Yes. And one of the earliest? On the first transport. First transport in mm -hmm. like the cattle car thing. Mm -hmm. And so many people, well, we heard of Dr. Al Nunzer. His sister Leah and sister Eva were both taken to Auschwitz and killed three days later. Right. So many people were killed days, weeks. Very few people lasted months. Right. Um, unless they were very skilled at doing something. Uh, they were a metallurgist. They were something, something, something that the right. Germans needed. Right. Otherwise, you're out of here. I was wondering what a particular skill an artist that draws skeletons had to the Germans that would be there uh -oh. so long. <laughs> it, he was really strong when he. So they. It was just labor, and so he managed to um, to survive a number of. It, uh, there was a number of episodes in his experience where he's just lucky to survive like there was um, one of the one of the one of the panels and I'm not sure I have a picture of it in here is of a tree and he calls it the tree of life where the these prisoners are climbing this tree because the guards are threatening them and there are dogs waiting for them and so the prisoners that fall out then are killed by the dogs and he so he gets to the top of this tree and he remarks of how beautiful it was to like, because he could see like the neighboring farms and, and how green it was around it. It was like this moment of like, of beauty in a really terrifying and intense situation. Um, but he remarks about how, that there's no real reason for him to make it and that, um, and he, carries in one of his details he's at the crematorium and he like his best friend growing up he has to carry and so um it wasn't any preponderance of skill he was just in his own words he was just lucky in many in many respects Uh, a lot of parchment, um, some paper, and they, you can see in some of them, like it's, there's two pieces. So, um, and then they're just glued to plywood or fixed to plywood, but there are sections, like they're, um, they're big pieces of paper, but they're kind of connected. Because this, this is, like I said, the ceiling's about 12 feet tall. So it's a massive panel. And did he name any of these works or did he just leave it? He didn't name anything. And he, like in that film, he talks about um, 
stories of his memory. Um, and he talks about um, a couple of individuals, one of them being Maximilian Kolbe, but um, the, the intense sense that you get is that um, identities washed away. And you have, like, in this, you see this image repeated throughout. Like, this is a self portrait, but that's. Right. Right. In, in the um, panel drawing that we were looking at a moment ago, there's a triangle up above. Mm -hmm. Have you all seen that? You, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah, yeah. Is that mm -hmm. what that? Yeah, yeah. And you had something, I'm sorry. So I just want to clarify all of this is post stroke. Right. And it's a compilation of 11 years that he just worked compulsively right. and never spoke of his experiences, but this is how he translated right. what he went through. And so the only, like there are, he does interviews, but they're related to this installation. Mm -hmm. So, and one of the things that, I, and I didn't mention this earlier, but that um, sort of shifted the focus of my work when I was doing research toward the arts is um, a man named um, Lawrence Langer, who's a he's a lit professor. He was at UMass Amherst, and I don't know if he still um, teaches or if he's emeritus or. But um, he was one of the scholars during the late 70s and 1980s that they, um, when they were trying to interview people and describe those interviews that was tasked with that. He was a, he's a brilliant writer and so he is interviewing all these different people, these, um, these survivors, and he's struggling um, the entire time to reconcile. He's limited in terms of what he can write because he has to start here and end here and then he has no choice but to put words in the middle and he's not sure that he's up for the task or that writing or discursive description of these events is, is enough. And so he shifts um, toward collecting poetry and narrative. And it's, there's one particular story um, in an interview he's conducting where um, he's interviewing a woman who's a survivor and her husband. Um, they've been married for um, for over 20 years, and she's talking to him about what happened to her. Um, she was 18 when the war started and, and had been married. She had an infant, and um, when they were rounded up in her town and put onto the trains, she brought what she, she brought her winter coat, she brought her infant, she brought the suitcase and her husband, and when they got to um, Auschwitz, she was separated immediately from her husband. She saw um, children being separated from their mothers, and so she tried to hide the infant under her coat. And so she passes the guard with the infant, and then the infant starts to cough and sputter and cry, and so the guard, um, the guard hears it and then takes the child. So she's telling Langer this story, and she goes, from that moment on, I've been alone. And so he's like, how, is it, how can I possibly describe what that's like in a way that makes sense to anybody by just saying this is what happened? And so it, it um, the, we have to try and think about this history and and what it still tells us today in a variety of different forms. And because if we rely solely on one, then we're ostracizing the number of people who need visual or need to hear it or need. And so broadening that gaze, I think, to include as many forms is, is critical. This is maybe a 
very foolish question. Do people have to lie down on the floor to really get the ceiling effect? It's uh, stunning. No, but it's, I mean, the way everything is angled, um, you don't have to, but it's it's overwhelming. Like, oh, it's impossible to... Um, And he's here, like as an old man, carrying this. It seems like all of the scenes are chaotic. They are. Mm -hmm. They are. So I think that would be overwhelming in itself. Right. Just to see them. Yeah, it's hard to. So this is Maximilian Kolbe, um, and he, the, he plays a really prominent role in, in Marion's work because he considers him the only decent man in, in Auschwitz. And what the story that, um, that begins to this legend in the camp is he's, one morning at a roll call, um, the guard decides that they're gonna they're gonna shoot every tenth person just indiscriminately, and one of the men um, who was chosen falls to his knees and begins crying. I have I have a wife. I have I have children. Please, you know, he's begging for his life, and Maximilian Kolbe takes his place. He asks the guard if I can take his place, and the guard says yes. <laughs> 